Well, hello and welcome to today's event called Riding the Social Media Wave, How South Carolina is Taming the Digital Tide. This is Morgan Wright. I'm a senior fellow with, uh, for government technology. I'm also a national news media analyst on issues of crime, technology, and identity theft, and have had the opportunity to testify a couple times before Congress. So I will tell you this will be much more interesting than testifying before Congress. So I'm excited to serve as the moderator for today's event. And I just want to say thank you to everybody on the line for joining us. I know we're going to have fun over the next 60 minutes. But before we begin, let's just do a couple of brief housekeeping notes. What we'd like to do is uh, make sure that, uh, that if you have any questions, it's designed to be interactive. The copy of this recording is going to be emailed to everybody within 48 hours after you see this. So make sure you participate in the Q&A also. You're going to see a Q&A box there. Ask any questions anytime during this. Ones that we don't get to uh, during the Q&A, we'll attempt to get to after the session's over. So make sure you send in your questions as they pop up through the presentation. Now, our speakers will, like I said, will try and address as many as, of these as we can. But uh, if you'd like to download, though, a PDF of the slides for this presentation, you can do so by clicking the Slides widget at the bottom of the console. Also on today's dev, uh, webinar, you'll be able to connect with a lot of your friends. Make sure you invite them. Use LinkedIn, use Twitter, use Facebook. Uh, I've already sent out the first tweet using hashtag GTLive, so make sure you connect with your peers across government technology platform and to make sure you let them know about what's going on. So also at this time, we recommend you disable any pop-up blockers you have, and if you're experiencing any media player issues or have any problems, you can visit the help, cast, or the help guide, the webcast, by clicking on the Help button at the bottom of the console. So what I'd like to do is have everybody welcome me today, or welcome me, welcome, help welcome our guests. Our two guests today that are going to be speaking are Amanda Stone. She is the Digital Project Supervisor at the South Carolina State Library. And also joining us will be Anil Chawla. He's the founder and CEO of Archive Social. So uh, what we're going to do real quick before we get started there is I'm going to take just a brief few minutes, and I'm going to kind of give you a state of the state, what's going on, how did we get to this point, and then what we're going to do is then we've got Amanda, we've got some poll questions, and then we have Anil. I know you guys are going to join this. So let's talk a little bit about this uh, before we get started. So let me, let me kind of give you guys a quick overview. This is really what this boils down to. This is about bits and bytes, ones and zeros. And what that is, that's not just bits and bytes. That's actually my name in binary code. It's easier to sign than it is to write this out. But folks, at the end of the day, we are transitioning now from a paper-based type of approach in government into where everything is almost going to start becoming ones and zeros. So as we, as we listen today, as you guys listen today, I'm really excited because I think this technology is great. I think how South Carolina is implementing this is great. So, But first, let's do a little bit of welcome to South Carolina. So um, I just had a couple fun facts I wanted to share with you. Some of you folks on the call already know that Columbia is the capital. Well, yellow jasmine obviously is the state flower. Now, there's an interesting story real quick about the great Carolina wren that I just found out from Amanda. Apparently, when the wren was put on the license plate, the tail was wrong, so they were selling stickers to correct the tail on the plate because it wasn't correct. Well, hey, look, folks, we've got the solution for that. We're just going to replace the state bird with the Twitter bird, and that's going to take care of everything. But in the meantime, you guys strap in because what we want to do now, too, is talk uh, a little bit about um, we're going to introduce to you uh, Anil Chawla, who's the uh, CEO of Archive Social, a civic tech company that specializes in archiving social media for public records requirements. Now, Archive Social partnered with the state of North Car or South Carolina to launch the world's first, or I'm sorry, North Carolina to launch the world's first open interactive archive of social media. Since then, Archive Social has enabled hundreds of government agencies such as the city of Rock Hill and the city of Somerville in South Carolina to ensure long-term transparency for government social media communications. The company was selected for the prestigious Code for America Accelerator in 2013 and recognized as a 2014 cool vendor in government, uh, in government by the leading analyst firm, Gartner. So before we get started, before we let Anil come in, what we want to do is throw out the poll to you guys and have everybody take a quick look at this. this what is your opinion on social media as a public record? And we're going to show you these results, and then Anil is going to hop into his presentation. First of all, what do you think? Do you think it's definitely a public record by law? Do you think it might be a record, but our activity is not worth retaining? Do you feel strongly that it is not a public record, or are you not sure and you just don't know at this standpoint? 
So what we'd like to do is have you guys take a look at that poll. We're going to publish the results of this poll. And then as we do, as we go through, we've got a second poll question towards the end of the presentation that we'll do for you. So let's kick it over and see what the poll results are before we bring Anil on. Well, look at that. 60% of you definitely think it's a public record by law. 10% uh, of you might be a record, but our activity is not worth retaining. Um, I think you'll find some interesting insights about what you think is not worth retaining might be the subject of a lawsuit at a later time. You feel strongly that it is not a public record, or 20% of you don't know. So I think for 40% of these folks, Neil, this is going to be a great time for them. For the 60% that think it's definitely a public record by law, I think you're going to show them some innovative ways uh, to address that. So why don't we get started? And Anil, let me turn this over to you. Morgan, thank you so much for the introduction there. And I, I do agree that poll is extremely insightful, and that is the subject matter of our conversation here today. Appreciate all of you on the phone and uh, tuned in on the webinar for carving out some time on your busy Thursday. When we talk about riding the social media wave, there's uh, obviously many benefits of social media, but there are also many challenges being a public entity. And one of the fundamental challenges is uh, managing the records of what you do for FOIA and for legal needs. And that's exactly what we're going to deep dive into in this webinar. And what I'd like to do in this webinar is not just talk about the hypotheticals or the academic issue of, of social media as a public record, but really share with you the real-life examples that we've seen in government and that we've personally come across uh, in the work with our customers. We uh, want to lay out the case that social media is a record. Uh, black and white, it is a medium that will create records that need to be maintained. But I do acknowledge and understand that this is an emerging issue, and I want to help walk you through some of the, the reasoning behind that. And uh, if I'm able to successfully convince you that this is something that your agency should be thinking about because ultimately it will protect your agency, I also want to arm you with solutions. Uh, make sure that you understand the different ways that you can keep records, starting from the most basic to some more sophisticated options. Uh, I have on here that I'm going to demonstrate an automated archive, but I'm really excited that Amanda Stone from the State Library is here, very forward-thinking on understanding these issues uh, there in the library. And Amanda is a great person to talk on this topic, so I'm going to let her actually share with you their work in terms of an automated demonstration. But I am here to answer your questions. So as, as, as you have questions come to mind during my, my presentation here, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A window, and we'll be happy to address them at the end. Now, to kick things off, uh, I do want to start with the records law just to establish a baseline before I go into those real-life examples. I know, uh, again, about 20% about of you were had no you know, answer, I don't know, in terms of whether social media is a record or not. And then some percentage of you, the other 20% felt that uh, it might be a record, but your activity is not worth retaining or it's actually not a record. And fundamentally, we do have to look at the law there in South Carolina, the FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. And it's important to recognize that these laws don't actually have to be updated to uh, specify social media. In fact, when you look across the nation, there's only one state that I'm aware of that's updated the law to include social media in, in the definition of public record. But uh, the reason why that doesn't have to happen is that the laws were written in a very forward, uh, future-proofed fashion. Uh, almost every public records law in the United States has a phrase that uh, the phrase is regardless of physical form. So regardless of physical form, the materials that are owned, used, in the possession of, retained by the public body our public record. And we see this phrase again in many, many states, um, states such as Florida, Washington, North Carolina, Ohio, Virginia, California, and many, many others have had guidance come out at the state level uh, interpreting this exact language to say that social media is a public record. And I really hope to see that here in South Carolina come from the state leaders. But the, at the end of the day, the law is written on the base of content. So the way to, way to think about that is if you were to receive a crime tip, it doesn't matter if you receive that crime tip on a piece of paper or in an email or in a tweet or a direct message. A crime tip is a crime tip, and it's the nature of the content that really matters and why your retention schedules are designed the way they are. So across the United States at this point, we are seeing fairly unanimous uh, agreement that social media can create public records. Now, that leads to the next question. If the law defines records in such a way that social media can be a public record, then What's happening on social media today that actually is record? I know about 10% of you said that your activity is probably not worth retaining today. And I strongly, strongly encourage you to, to think about what's happening on social media and what can happen because if you are active on these channels and you're actually able to utilize these channels effectively, uh, I'm uh, convinced that you're, you're absolutely going to use social media in a way that matters that's going to create records. Uh, and to sort of prime that thinking, here's a few examples. 
Uh, the most obvious examples come from public safety and emergency response, uh, especially if there's a natural disaster or a large-scale crime. We have seen now in government in the last several years that social media provides perhaps the most efficient and most effective way for government to disseminate information during crisis. Uh, it allows you to control the message. It allows you to utilize your audience to amplify that message. Um, and so these are situations where, for example, the Boston bombings, um, we're all very familiar with that. The Twitter feed was watched by the world when, when the Boston PD was hunting down the terror suspect. And a bit of a trivia fact here is when the Boston PD finally caught the terror suspect, the very first announcement that they caught the suspect was a tweet. It wasn't a tip to a journalist. It wasn't a posting on their website. It was a tweet. It was important to get that information out. So you hopefully will never have a situation like that happen where you, where you are, but um, you certainly do have crimes and emergency situations, um, I'm sure, throughout the year. And the more you can use so, social media to get the information out, the better you'll serve your, be able to serve and protect the citizens. But you will be creating content uh, in that act of doing that that is important and needs to be maintained. Now, outside of these big situations, uh, it's also important to remember why government agencies are on social media and why, why your government agency, um, you know, does what it does. Uh, you know, fundamentally, I believe that government exists to serve the citizens. Uh, so, in, in, in effect, as an agency throughout the day, whether you're on social media or in your other ways that you interact with citizens, what you're doing is providing that customer service uh, for your citizens. And social media also gives you this wonderful ability to get the citizen feedback and have a two-way conversation. Uh, and to give you a clear example of what I mean by that, this is uh, dealing with the Texas Department of Transportation. It's just a random tweet that we, we pulled off the web just as a, to see, you know, is that, is that a true premise? Uh, can we look at any, any Twitter feed and find customer service happening? That's, that's really obvious. And in this case, a citizen was trying to call the Texas DOT, couldn't get through, so she actually tweeted at them. They told her that the phone lines must be busy, and ultimately she determined that the phone number on a mailing was incorrect. So she's able to report this information, have this conversation, help them help Texas DOT correct this mailing through this Twitter conversation. And this gets documented on Twitter. Again, it has nothing to do even with t transportation per se, but it's, it, it's in the embodiment of this agency is customer service. Uh, this is just one simple example of something that's non-obvious, uh, but really does create records that are worth keeping because it's citizen feedback and it's a, a dialogue that helps document um, this mistake that was made on the mailing. So hopefully as you look at your social media and you're able to use social media in a way that's impactful, you will see that the real conversations are happening, real communications that are, that are, that are only existing on social media. They need to be maintained. But the, the next question is who's asking for them? Uh, and it turns out that while it's still an emerging topic, the citizens are starting to ask for this content. This is a really obvious example dealing with the Seattle PD from April of last year. Uh, and in fact, the citizen was following the Twitter feeds for Seattle PD thought that there might be some information missing from those Twitter feeds that the Seattle PD had committed to putting out. And so they asked for the archives of the Twitter feeds, and they actually tweeted it. So they said, I want the archives of all the Twitter feeds, and please consider this a public records request in the tweet. So in effect, it was a public records request for social media using social media, a really a sign of, a sign of the times. Uh, and Seattle PD did acknowledge that this is a true public records request. They directed the citizen to use the web form that they have, the standard web form, but um, they also responded back saying, give us three weeks um, to, to respond to this request. Um, so the real question for your agency is, if this happens to you, is it going to be three weeks? What kind of burden might this be? And, and really, how can you make this three minutes um, so that you can focus on, on, on what's important and not get bogged down with this kind of request? Now, that's a very specific example, but the reality is that um, you may be receiving requests for social media today not even realizing it. A lot of our customers have now recognized this that they receive requests that have this kind of language in it, uh, any and all documents, all reports of the incident, all notifications of the street closure. If you really think about it, um, if you're reporting on, on their social media feed during a winter storm that streets are being closed, that's a notification of a street closure, and it's it should be included in, in the response to this request. Uh, and so uh, many of our customers and many agencies across the country are recognizing this and starting to include social media when the language is somewhat broad like this. So now we've talked about actually having to produce this information potentially um, in real life, um, but really to hammer that point, what's happening from a case law standpoint? Because ultimately case law is really what motivates and determines um, how, you, how you address this issue and whether you're going to be proactive and how important it is to be proactive. Um, 
I think there's a lot of learning that we can have if we look at email because email is a perfect analogy for what's happening with social media right now. Uh, about 15 to 20 years ago, the question was, was is, is email a record? Do we really have, do anything important on email that's worth keeping? Is this, does email have anything that's, not, not, that's actually not documented elsewhere? Uh, and we obviously know the answer to that today, and we archive our email and maintain those records. But we've learned some, some things from case law that we really shouldn't repeat. Um, this is a case uh, dealing with the city of Shoreline, Washington. Um, but the, the nuts and bolts of this is that the city was asked to produce an email. They were able to produce a copy of the email, but not the original. Uh, and so what happened was the citizen realized they were getting a copy of the email, not the original. They asked for the original, and they said, give me all the metadata, which is that technical information uh, in an email about how it was sent and where, what computer sent servers it was sent across and so forth. And the city couldn't produce it. They just had a copy of the original email, but not the original. Uh, and the courts actually ruled that the city was responsible for producing the original record with all the original metadata, fined the city $100,000, and then the city had to settle and pay the plaintiff's fees, which cost more than half a million dollars. So the lesson learned here is that even having some record is not necessarily where you want to be ultimately because the difference between some record and the record you need to have could be half a million dollars or more. So when we talk about solutions, I want to give you some insights into what agencies are doing, but this is an important issue to consider is how good of a record can you keep to really protect your agency. And the translation for social media is that the metadata also exists for social media. A tweet that's 126 characters in this case has more than 2,000 characters in metadata, details like user IDs and timestamps and so forth. Another lawsuit that we've, we've learned a bit from dealing a little bit closer to home with social media is the city of Honolulu and the Honolulu Police Department received a lawsuit for moderating content. So if any of you are removing content from your social media site or hiding it, uh, this would be of interest to you. Uh, a group basically filed a First Amendment lawsuit saying that their content should not have been moderated, that they have freedom of speech. Uh, this court case, this case was not ruled upon in court, um, but the city decided to settle it by just paying the attorney's fees for the plaintiff. Uh, we at Archive Social still firmly believe in your right to be able to moderate content, and you, but you must have a clear policy in place. And so if you don't have a policy today, that's something that uh, we can help with outside of our archiving service. We have a free policy template on our website. But ultimately, you need, you need to set that policy and adhere to it. But the real point I want to make here with record keeping is that uh, social media is just like any other government activity. It could be subject to litigation. And if you end up in court uh, in regards to content that you've deleted, how do you tell your side of the story if you haven't kept records? So regardless of whether you're doing everything perfectly or not, going to court means you have to present your case, and having records is fundamental to presenting your case in court. And that actually takes me to three case studies that we've learned from our customers. I'll keep these brief, but they're really insightful. Uh, we had a customer in South Florida recently who was faced with a lawsuit because they had put out a scam alert about a local company. They had learned that the company was potentially a scam from a, from a law firm. The company did not agree with that label and uh, asked the city to remove the postings on Facebook and, and Twitter about being, them being a scam. Uh, but then the company also came back and filed a lawsuit saying that you've damaged their reputation in the lawsuit, we want all records of, of communication saying that we're a scam, including the ones we've already asked you to, to delete. Uh, and so this, this uh, city had fortunately signed up to start archiving a few months in advance, and they had all the records they could produce it. But that's the kind of situation you may not, may not account for when, when the police department is just trying to do the right thing and protect the citizens. Another case study across the country, again, the police department doing the right thing, uh, basically implementing a city program that uh, was a gun buyback program, um, they had just started using our product and about three weeks in received a public information request from the NRA in regard to the gun buyback program because the NRA wants to ensure that, that the program is being run in accordance with law. Uh, but, the law but the public information request had asked for all of the social media. And so the city, again, had just signed up three weeks uh, before the request came in uh, and was able to produce all that content. And so that's a really valid public information request that you might receive, and being pre prepared is obviously important. And finally, in Spokane, Washington, this is a government uh, technology case study that you can actually download off of their website uh, in which the city of Spokane um, was simply promoting an event uh, on their social media. So doing something very innocuous as promoting an event, which almost all government agencies do on social media. Unfortunately, somebody died on that event, and so the lawsuit did request all of the social media records. And they had two years of content to produce, and they were able to do so because they had a record-keeping strategy in place. So those are three of our customers that have faced situations. Um, I want to talk to you about solutions here with the remaining minutes that I have.
Now, before I get into the actual solutions, I'm going to build up from, from the most basic to the most sophisticated. Um, please realize that you cannot ri rely on the social networks to keep the records for you. Um, they have made, Facebook and Twitter have made zero guarantees to you as a government agency that your data will be available and in compliance with South Carolina's requirements. But more importantly, when something is deleted, it's gone forever. And even if you don't delete anything, someone, uh, a citizen that's sending you important content could, could later delete that message they've sent you. Uh, and you may not even know that they deleted it and it's, it's gone forever. So you do need to manage this yourself. And the way to start is with screenshotting as the most basic approach. If you're not doing anything at all, it's better than nothing. Um, it's, uh, you know, pros and cons wise, it's free, right? It doesn't cost you anything to procure screenshotting. Um, but it is a stopgap, and so you do need to recognize that um, it's an enormous time investment, especially if you're comprehensive and you're screenshotting. It could take anywhere from 20 to 30 hours a week for a very modest social media presence. I'm sorry, 20 to 30 hours a month. Um, and so it could be very time consuming. It's hard to manage the data, and ultimately the records are not um, necessarily the, the best records you could have in a legal situation because anybody can Photoshop anything these days. Uh, screenshots don't have the metadata that we talked about. But it is something that I would strongly encourage you to do, especially if you're moderating content. Go, and keep, go ahead and keep a screenshot so that you are protected to some extent. Now, several years ago, backup tools started uh, emerging in the space. Um, and so there are a number of very, very inexpensive backup tools out there. Um, backup of five, which the prices have increased, but they're still fairly inexpensive. They're about $100 a month. Uh, Social Safe, which is maybe $20 a year. Um, these are consumer-oriented backup tools that uh, many agencies have tried out. Um, it's worth exploring if you really don't have any budget to get something automated in place. The downside of these tools is that they are built for consumers um, and not government-grade record keeping. And so for $20 a year, you're probably going to get generally what you pay for in terms of, of, of compliance and, and, and legal needs. Uh, so, for example, SocialSafe is a, is a really inexpensive tool, but it does just store the content locally on your own hard drive, uh, not in the cloud, not protected uh, out for you. You have to figure out how to then protect that data. Uh, and then generally these tools are very basic in their search capabilities, so they're not really built for records management and being able to respond to records requests, but they do provide some level of backup. Much, much better is to look at archiving. So there are a number of archiving vendors out there, including us. Now, <coughs> excuse me. There are vendors that come from email archiving and web page archiving, and then there are social media archiving vendors like us. It's really important um, to understand what your needs are from an archiving standpoint. Uh, an all-in-one archiving vendor is um, attractive from the sense that if you need to archive email and websites and other types of content that your IT is not managing, uh, it may be nice to get it all in one system. What I would strongly encourage you to do, to do though, is understand how is social media being treated. Is it being converted to email? Is it being captured like a website would be captured? Because those types of approaches will not get the metadata. They will not be as comprehensive. They have data loss due to data conversion. They make it really hard to deal with social media content, which is interactive and conversational. So you have to understand if, uh, when you look at these all-in-one vendors, which one of these vendors is really committed to social media uh, and is storing the social media data to the same level of quality as, as their bread and butter of email archiving or web page archiving. Now, there's um, uh, several vendors out there, but generally their pricing ranges from a few thousand to several thousand dollars a year. Some of them have setup fees, so it's worth just exploring those. Uh, and finally, there's social media archiving vendors. What I would say is that there's four criteria to, to look at in any vendor that you evaluate for social media archiving. One is making sure you can capture the content as frequently as possible because it's out there on Twitter and Facebook, meaning that the longer you take, the, the bigger time window it could be lost. You do want to be as comprehensive as possible because this, this commu these communications are being broadcast in the public now, and uh, you having more records on your side will be better from a legal situation standpoint so that you can tell your side of the story. You do want that metadata. You do want to think about authenticity. Again, those screenshots are not necessarily provable in court, so how do you prove the authenticity of your records in court? And then context, how do you actually make sense of these communications when you need to produce them? So if you're producing a Facebook conversation from five years ago, with 100 comments on it, how do you really make sense of that Facebook conversation and produce it in an easy manner so that whoever you're sending it to understands they're getting everything they asked for? Um, that's what we believe is fundamental uh, in a social media archiving solution. Um, so I strongly encourage you to uh, evaluate those criteria. And um, one thing that's exciting, I know Anna, Amanda's uh, going to share a brief demo with you, but there are some open archives that we've launched with uh, governments around the country, um, City of Austin, State of North Carolina, South Carolina, as Amanda will show you. Uh, but I wanted to highlight an archive here for Snohomish County. Uh, they were um, victims of the mudslide last year that happened up in the state of Washington, and uh, they had a, a really fantastic response on social media uh, 
for that emergency. They coined a hashtag called 530 Slide to track all of their emergency management. And if you go to their social media archive of all of their public records, which are openly available, you can actually search for hashtag 530 Slide and replay that emergency response. And so uh, wrapping up, here's my direct contact information, including my, my cell phone number. So if you have any questions for me, I'd, I'd be happy to be a resource. And if you want to see what it's like to have your own archive, you can uh, set one up for free. You can sample your own archive in less than 60 seconds on our website to understand what it means to have your own record keeping. And with that, I'll hand it back to Morgan. Thank you so much. Hey, and folks, just to let you know, I know Neil's going to be embarrassed, but everybody should congratulate. He's a new dad within the last couple weeks, so uh, congrats. Uh, I'm surprised he was awake for this because uh, obviously with dad duty and mom duty, they're staying, they're staying busy. So, Neil, hey, great presentation. And, folks, I think one of the things you'll see out of this as we've watched, everybody just recognize Twitter is a new platform, comparatively speaking, Facebook, social media. The fact that we have a solution for normally what takes government quite a while to catch up, to me, is, is indicative of the fact is that there are people forward-thinking, folks like Anil and his company. He's the CEO, working with folks like Amanda. So to really, as we say, get ahead of the tide, you know, riding the wave, getting ahead of this digital tide that's going to come uh, later. So, hey, but great job. So let's go now before we bring on Amanda. Let's go to our next poll question. And in that question, this is kind of informative, too. So how is your agency currently retaining records of social media? So we're not retaining our own records and rely simply on the networks. You guys take manual captures. Um, you use a personal backup tool like Backupify or SocialSafe. You use an automated solution for archiving. Or you're already a happy archive social customer, which will make Anil happy and the groups. But uh, let's want you guys to take a look at that for a second. And really, this is going to help Amanda then set the stage for her live demonstration that she's going to do here in just the next minute. So let's go back and let's see what the results of the poll are. The, uh, the poll are. And as we can see right there, 70% of you, even though 60% said it's a public record, we now see that 70% are saying um, that they're not capturing it. Uh, they, or they take if 15% of you basically take manual captures, and about another 15% you use an automated solution for archiving. So I think there's a lot of room for growth uh, in this area. So that's really good. So now let's what we're going to do now is we're, we're going to move on, and let me take the uh, pleasure to now introduce to you Amanda Stone. Amanda is the manager of collections and digitization at the South Carolina State Library, where she manages acquisitions and processing of library materials. She also manages digital projects such as making available historical and current state agency documents, including the partnership with Archive Social to make state government social media more accessible. She has a BS and an MLIS from the University of South Carolina and has been with the South Carolina State Library since 2005. That's 10 years. You've seen a lot of change in just 10 years, Amanda. So let's turn this over to you and let you guys and let you talk to everybody on the webinar about what South Carolina is doing. So Amanda, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Morgan. I really appreciate that intro. Uh, and yes, the, the library world certainly has changed in the last 10 years. I wanted to do a quick intro just to talk about how the state library is involved. We are the um, primary administrator of government funds to state libraries. Uh, we do a variety of services. And then What's probably most important is that we provide library service to state government agencies in the state, and we also are responsible for state government publications. So historically, we have been the people who maintain print copies of state publications. So if you think about the kinds of things that health departments publish, lots of statistics, lots of information from Department of Agriculture, you can see here ranging from 1880s to very current Department of Natural Resources um, publications. So we used to get them in print. Obviously now we get them born digitally. Uh, and we provide access to citizens and to other state agencies, uh, employees across the state. And so we were already in the realm of how do we deal with, make accessible, and maintain access to state government information. And so, um, in the beginning, Anil did a great job of talking already about um, what public records are in the state. Um, there isn't a mention of social media as a public record in South Carolina, uh, and you can see that law again. 
Hmm. We may actually be missing a bit of a slide, but that's all right. So we um, another part of sort of what we see in South Carolina, and actually this is an article that Anil sent to me. Um, our archives talks about social media as being a way to disseminate information and really not as a public record. Uh, he said, you know, one of the people who work there says that, you know, they don't have the means to archive it. And that may or may not be true. Um, but right now, um, our state records is not considering records as um, public, um, public records that need to be scheduled and maintained in the same way as other records. So there's a link to that article that you might be interested in. It's from the Municipal One thing that's of current interest that really has had a lot of talk is there fairly recently was an executive order uh, by our governor um, that was called the State Employee Code of Conduct Order. And she um, made a task force that talked about code of conduct and lots of different ethical issues. But one of it very specifically said that um, one of the recommendations the task force has is that agencies and uh, state employees should not use social media except when they are performing a job function. So as you can see, we're in a very um, interesting climate here in South Carolina. Um, this is not yet in enacted, and agencies are definitely talking about what this means. And there's a lot of leeway to interpret that using Facebook, using Instagram is a job function in a lot of ways, but it is part of sort of the climate that we see. So the State Library has been providing a way to talk about social media in state government since 2008. We actually have a state government social media idea exchange, which has been a Facebook group and has lots of different kinds of webinars over the years. We're actually going to have a in-person um, meetup later this, this spring to really talk about how to use social media for state government work. So as you can see, we talk about how to give groups um, a voice, how to use social media, um, and how to, how to manage it. And so in the context of this, We heard about Archive Social, and we heard about Archive Social through library channels, as you might imagine. Um, North Carolina's um, archives and state, state library had been starting work with Anil and working with Archive Social to create a public forum and a, a public way that citizens can access social media. It was really interesting. We were in a, um, in a session with North Carolina um, librarians, and they almost as an aside, showed us their, um, their social media site. And nobody else could, could get a word in edgewise. Everybody started asking questions about the social media um, archives that they, and the work they've been doing with Archive Social instead of the topic that North Carolina wanted to talk about. And we really, um, as a group and as a profession, started realizing that this was, this was needed and this was a conversation that was happening all across the country. So we started a beta um, site and a small account with Archive Social um, over the last year. We partnered with six state agencies with 30 accounts, and we'll take a look at the demo shortly. Uh, and you can see that we have a public search that anyone can access. And here are our participants. It's the Arts Commission, Department of Commerce, our Consumers Affairs Department, um, our Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism. Education Oversight Committee, our Emergency Management Division. And it's interesting that Anil really focused on that. I think they, in a lot of ways, have really great content and a really great story to tell about why social media is so important. Uh, we, um, we maintain access to the School Improvement Council and also the State Library, which is our account. And I know this is a lot of text, but just wanted to, to detail that when we work with a state agency, uh, we do require that they sign a memorandum of understanding that the content that we are going to provide access to includes both their communication and the communication back from citizens. Um, that the content is going to be digitally timestamped, it's captured, um, Archive Social has to 
you know, has to have um, the ability to um, to maintain their in, their state information, um, and that we will um, collect all data and keep it um, for at least a year, even if we decide to discontinue the service. It's not that we plan on doing so. So one of the most interesting things is the, some of the concerns we heard back. So we do have some partners, and we really hope in the future to get a, get a lot more. Um, but some of the people we reached out to um, ha did have concerns. Um, the South Carolina Governor's School for the Arts and Humanities were concerned because the people who were responding back to the school feeds were, as you might imagine, their students. It was minors communicating back. And they, they or originally thought that maybe we could just get the communication that they were, that the Governor's School was sending out and not the communication back, but they, they declined um, to be a partner. Um, South Carolina is interesting in our, that our main website, our sc.gov, is um, created by a third-party company. They're actually not a state agency. Uh, and so they said, you know, our um, Twitter feeds, our Facebook, even though it's about state government and is most citizens would not realize the difference, they're not a technically a state agency and they don't consider their information to be um, a public, necessarily a public record. Um, and then for the, um, the current project, we decided not to include higher education. Um, partially it was just outside our mission scope, um, and also that's a, a lot of Twitter feeds. So we probably will reinvestigate that in the future. One of the other concerns that we saw when we talked to the Emergency Management Division, they were really interested. They have been our most vocal partner uh, and have been really interested in understanding how their social media is is um, is being used and how they are using their social media. So uh, one thing they had a concern was is that while their content isn't copyrighted, a lot of times they link to copyrighted information, and they have had issues with photographs that they have sent out being reused to indicate that the Emergency Management Division sponsored a program, that they sponsored a product, uh, when in fact they didn't. Um, and so they do, sometimes, and they do sometimes include copyrighted materials. So we added in, um, language saying that it is your responsibility if you use this library to obtain permission um, before making use of this material. In general, it's going to be fine, but we did want to make sure that people understood that not everything that is being linked necessarily is, in cop is out of copyright. Um, and you can, as you can see, um, the Emergency Management Division has some of their own language about copyright. And as we decided to go ahead with this project, uh, the Department of Archives and History here in South Carolina, which is a separate agency, a lot of states it's the same, but uh, with South Carolina it's in fact the State Library and Archives are separate agencies. They had a concern over archives as being the primary mission of the program. They, didn't, they do not currently schedule social media. They don't plan to in the immediate future. And they really see social media, as we talked about, as a primary record, as, as um, as a secondary record used for announcement purposes. Um, and in that vein, we decided to change the language to library. And we talk about the social media library as being a, um, a citizen tool that's used for research. Um, we can use it for FOIA requests, and we talk to our partners about that, um, but they are not encouraged to use archive social, our archive social instance for um, the primary use of their FOIA request. So it's a complicated situation, um, but one that we're actively working towards, and we're having conversations about why, um, why social media is a public record that needs to be, um, needs to be archived and needs to be accessed um, for a long time. And so again, we changed some language so that we provide access to social media activity. So one of the interesting use cases we've had is um, 
we had an ice storm February 2014, and then immediately after this very large ice storm, we had an earthquake, which is not actually very common here in South Carolina. We get lots of little ones, um, but this, this was a fairly big one. So we had a series of events um, kind of in this week of February, and we definitely saw a spike in the amount of, um, of social media um, records that were that were occurring. Everybody was on social media talking about the snow and the ice and then the earthquake, as you might imagine. And so the Emergency Management Division, after all this had happened, contacted us and said, hey, we're writing up a report talking about um, how our social media got used, uh, how often it got commented on. Um, and as you can see, over 2,000 records were saved about messages that they, had, that they had sent or that had been sent back to them over their several um, accounts. And one thing that's interesting is that they tweeted for the first time um, after the earthquake about four minutes and two seconds. And so that was one of the first official um, statewide um, agencies that had tweeted and really said, hey, yes, we think it's an earthquake. We're going to get confirmed by the USGS. And then a few minutes later, they did. So people knew that it was, in fact, an earthquake. So they're quick on the draw. And one of the things we, we like to talk about is not just what the state agencies can do for us by participating in, but what we can do to help our, our participants. So right now, we're the primary benefactors. Um, people sign up for our, our accounts. We get to see all the social media. And then they don't hear back from us. We're beta testing for Archive Social. Um, we and, and several other of their customers are, are beta testing some potential tools. So there might be opportunities for alerts. We might be able to give the state agencies um, a way that they can be notified if there's profanity or personally identifiable information or keywords. Um, and this is all in beta. So, But we would love to be able to see ways that we can, in fact, have a collaboration. And one way we like it is that we can have we could have a potentially an alert so that if other state agencies, such as the Arts Commission, talks about libraries in the state, we know and then we can retweet. So here there's the Arts Commission talking about how um, Sumter County Library is um, celebrating back Black History Month and then the state library can go in and really help promote those activities. In the future, we're probably going to look at a simpler MOU. Uh, we would like better communication with our partners. We already have a larger account with Archive Social. We're looking at opening to higher ed, maybe limiting one or two of their main accounts, and continued communication with Archive to really better make um, the laws and the way our agencies talk about social media different. Um, my contact information. Um, but I really would like to get over and show you a live demo. It may take a minute to show up. But this is a South Carolina State Agency social media library. And as you can see, we have um, that copyright information at the top. You can see related links to our partners. But really, it is a, a very Google-like experience. You've got a giant keyword box. And the first thing I'm going to search for is that thing on everybody's mind. Have you done your taxes yet? And so once it's searched and returns results, it's going to sort by relevance. So what I like to do is if you go up to the top right, I like to sort by time. I always like to see what happens first. And the first thing that you see is one of the State Library's tweets that's um, talking about legislation in another state. But as you go down, you can see there are um, links from, you know, there are tweets and Facebook postings from state parks. You can see comments. You can see information about the, from the School Improvement Council. I know there's a bit of a delay, so as we scroll down. Nobody gets seasick from the from the scrolling down. 
And as you click on a, on a specific account, I'm not sure the pop-up is going to You can actually get to the link in Facebook itself. I'm not going to do that, but if you click on it, you can actually get to the School Improvement Council's uh, Facebook page. If you click on the actual posting, what you're going to get And it's cut off a little bit, but what you're going to get is the content type. You're going to get the kind of account. You're going to get the time it was created, and you're going to see that it's been digitally signed and source data. So what you're going to have is that metadata that Anil talked about. Emails have metadata, so do social media postings. And so those are the kinds of the kind of data that for a FOIA request you could give to somebody and know that the kind of um, and know a lot about when that post was done, and what kind of account it was at. So, as you can see, the pictures show up. Well, the pictures get um, archived as well. And you can always link, open the links in the new window. Scroll back up to the top. Again, nobody gets seasick. You can limit on the left-hand side by type of account. So at the top, you can see that the most Postings are from the South Carolina State Parks. You can also see Twitter accounts, our SCDCA, that's actually our Department of Consumer Affairs, South Carolina State Library, and so on. If you're just interested in Facebook content or Twitter content, you can go down and um, filter your results just by those, that kind of content. And you can also get date ranges. I'm going to go back up to the top. I'm going to click at the top icon, and I'm going to go to Advanced Search. And this is how I got the content information for the Emergency Management Division, is you can do a date range. So you can either just see what happened in the last seven days, 30 days, or I did a custom range for that week last year. You can search just for a specific kind of content. You can search just for Facebook. You could search just for Facebook photos if you're interested in the kinds of photos that are taken by state government that are, um, and that are communicated that way. You can also search specifically by, a kind, by text. Search by text, who the um, post is from, who it is to, or the account name. So lots of different search search strategies that can be done there. And I'm going to search for spring box. And again, I'm going to sort by time. And you can see photos. Four hours ago, you can see uh, pictures that people have taken. Scrolling down to see the red. So sometimes what you see are um, replies. And so those look like they're very standalone. You don't know what they're um, in response to. But if you see where it says view thread on some of, this, some of the postings, you can see the actual um, original post. And you can see all the comments that happened under. So Anil talked about the way, you know, looking at your, your solution for archiving and seeing if you can piece out the threads and that you can look at the content the way it is originally in social media, which is these postings followed by comments. Um, and the nice part is with Archive Social, you really can do that. You can see it in a very true-to-form way and the way that most people would look at social media. And again, with the photos, you can open up straight to a specific photo. I clicked on a link for flowers, and it does open up the actual Facebook page. And now you can see the live version.
and I see a few questions. Um, I think that's it for the actual um, demo. It's so easy that it's easy to show off. All right, well, hey, Amanda, that was terrific. In fact, we do have some questions. So what we want to do is let's move on into our uh, Q&A period. But before we get started, folks, um, we're going to jump into the questions, but we're getting a lot of questions about getting copies, getting answers uh, of today's presentation. So within 48 hours, Government Technology will provide everybody with a link to the recording for your reference and to share with your uh, colleagues. And make sure as we, answer, uh, as we start to answer some questions, hop on there. Send us your question. I know both Anil and Amanda would love to talk about a couple things. And in fact, um, Amanda, I want to throw something out to you because we kind of noticed this during your presentation. In our poll, it said 70% of the people feel that social media is a record. But you had kind of mentioned that you said where the state said uh, that the state archives might not be considering social media to be a public record. So what's your advice to these agencies? You know, How do you recommend agencies approach this issue? Sure. I think they need to look at the language themselves, and I think a lot of agencies are doing that. Um, we haven't had a lot of case law here or a lot of instances of FOIA requests exactly for social media. I think the time, however, we will see it. Um, and um, right now, I think it's in flux. Um, as we communicate more with archives and talk about how um, state agencies are using social media, I think they're going to see that it's more than just a communication tool. Um, there is actual content in these postings that is original. Um, and I would say each agency needs to look for themselves and see what kind of solution works for them and what their needs are. Okay, and actually a quick follow-up to that too. One question, then we've got a couple for Anil as well. But uh, we, we get this from Beverly Harris. She says, Amanda, is there an opportunity for local government entities in South Carolina to get assistance from the state library? Sure. We'd be happy to have the communication and talk with you. Um, right now, our actual social media library is just for the state, um, and that's just you know, through this fiscal year. That's you know, the decision we've had to make. We'd love to communicate with you. I know there are other local governments in South Carolina that are wrestling with us. Um, and we'd be happy to have a communication um, with you. So um, please look at my contact information. I'd love to talk with you. Absolutely. And Anil, this one's for you. This is the one we always get. People go, gee, I love the technology. Gee, it works great. Um, how much does it cost? So why don't you just kind of uh, let people know a little bit about uh, Archive Social, the cost, and, and, and how easy uh, it is to get this going. Sure thing. I'd be happy to answer that question. And because we promote a, a solution for transparency, uh, we're very transparent with all that information. It's all on our website, archivesocial.com. There's a link to the pricing. But just to give a general sense, um, our pricing is designed that uh, it should be a discretionary spend for 90% of, of entities out there, state and local entities, uh, which means that um, most, almost, if not everyone on this call would be under 5000 annual. Um, without any kind of setup fees or anything like that. We do have some lower pricing plans as well if, if your presence is a little bit smaller than that. So we try to make this extremely cost effective. And uh, it really is a matter of um, if you see the need and want to be proactive um, and can procure that budget of under 5000 and perhaps even less than that, it takes about uh, less than 30 minutes on average for a customer to set this up and be protected. Oh, absolutely. And um, one of the other things is uh, we got another question too is how does Archive Social capture new content. I mean, you, can you just explain a little bit of all the platforms you cover and then how you capture that? Sure. So today we, we, we uh, interact with Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn, uh, those being the most popular social networks that we've seen in terms of government usage. And we actually talk directly with the social networks from a technical standpoint throughout the day, uh, pulling the information on what we call a continuous fashion. Uh, it's not instant because that technology doesn't exist, but rather than waiting a day or a week like many uh, solutions do from uh, older types of technology, because we're social media focused, we know that it's a real-time conversation and are continuously pulling that content from the networks and that authentic format that we talked about. Yeah, I think and that's I, key because the key thing is oh, – I'm sorry, go ahead, Anil. I should add that you know the landscape of social media continues to change, so one of our big, big efforts this year is expanding the, the list of networks that we support. So we're really eager to hear from government entities in terms of what social media channels they're finding most impactful in terms of engaging the citizens. 
And that's actually where it's going because a long time ago nobody knew what Instagram was, and then then it was Pinterest. And you know, so as these platforms evolve, the key thing is going to be what what is really driving government conversation. We've got another question here from Michael Mullen, and I think it's for both of you, Neil. Why don't you take a pass at it, then Amanda? But he's asking, would because I think this one we're talking about a moderation and not deleting things. Uh, he asks, would the agency be covered if they do not delete any posts? Uh, I mean, is there is there any issues there if you I mean if you don't delete anything um, as opposed to moderation? Well, that, that's a great question. Um, so, if your agency never deletes anything, then then are you safe? Can you continue to rely on the networks? Um, and 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 the answer to be black and white, the answer is no. Um, now, you hope that if you have a records request or legal situation and you're not record keeping, you could try to find the content on Facebook and Twitter. But at the end of the day, these networks do not have any guarantees in place to retain your content. In fact, Facebook has a disclaimer that if anything's deleted, that you can no longer expect to even be able to subpoena it from them. So um, that's the key issue, that content can and will be deleted. Um, there have been studies in terms of information decay, whether the information just goes away or is actually removed. Uh, it's a significant percentage of information decays over time. Uh, and what you're really concerned about, even if your agency is perfect, you never have an employee that deletes anything. Uh, we have lots of stories where employees have um, ended up deleting something, even when the agency thought they, that no one would. Uh, the citizens can delete what they say to you, whether it's a comment, a private message, a post on your wall. Like I said, a citizen sends you a crime tip and then decides that they don't want their name associated with anything, they decide to remove it. Um, the fact that they've already sent you that crime tip means you are responsible for it, but it's gone to the network. So you do need to retain this outside of the networks. And many states have actually put that in their guidance that you cannot rely on the social networks to keep this content. Yeah, I think that's important. Amanda, have you had any experience in that so far to where people have thought, hey, if we just leave it up there and never delete it, we can go back and get it? Um, and, you know, and obviously using Archive Social, have you run across that yet? Sure. Uh, one thing we see is uh, link rot in the in the library world. We is how we call it. But you know, you'll link to things that no longer exist, and you might use Bitly or you might use some kind of link shortening, and not know where it comes from. Um, I like that o Archive Social um, maintains the uh, where the link shortener is actually sending you to, so you always know that, um, even if um, even if the site disappears. Um, and yes, I mean we have definitely seen um, content be deleted. Uh, Anil's instance of deliberate removal of things like profanity, inappropriate content. Um, there, I get lots of questions asked as to whether I should take that content down. Um, and a lot of agencies feel that they should. Um, I like it that it might still be available here, even if it's not on the live site, so you can go back and um, and see the kinds of content that's happening. And actually, we've got time for probably one more question. So this is one out for both of you from Raven Favor. She goes, hi, how do you popularize social media in a government not known for social media? So what's kind of your best parting advice for how do people, how do you get your folks to, to embrace the 21st century here? That's a tough one. Let's go with uh, you, man. Yeah. <laughs> there are, we still see lots of agencies here in South Carolina that – um, that don't use social media. And I would say that I'm not sure without social media how we would talk to what we consider to be a, an average citizen. I don't know how Department of Ed would talk to parents. I'm not sure how Department of Revenue right. would talk to the average taxpayer, um, except on social media. New, paper newsletters are dead. <laughs> um, well, we absolutely. don't know that everybody's going to a website. This way you can push the content to where they are. And Anil, what's your parting guidance on that? How, how, in your travels throughout all these states, how have you been able to help agencies really embrace the use of social media? Well, I think Amanda nailed it, uh, that, that this is where the citizens are. You need to be where the citizens are. And the numbers are staggering in terms of social media usage uh, here in the United States. Uh, I think a stat has now uh, been for a while that people spend more time on Facebook and Twitter on, than any other activity online, including email. Uh, and ultimately what we find is that even if the government is not on social media, the conversation about government is happening on social media. So what you want to do is you want to join that conversation and help steer it in the right direction. Well, guys, look, I, I know we could go on. There's a lot more questions here, but we have to be respectful of our one-hour commitment to everybody. So first of all, Anil, we want to thank you and thank Archive Social for sponsoring this Writing the Social Media Wave, How South Carolina is Taming the Digital Divide. And I'd like to thank everybody on the call for joining us. A big thank you goes to Amanda Stone for also uh, uh, 
doing just a great job showing the demo, and I'm sure everybody now is going to want to go get their free demo, and obviously Archive Social for allowing us to bring this discussion to everybody. So thank once again. If you have any questions, here's some contact information. All of the uh, webinar webinars are available on demand, and if you have any questions, please contact me. Would love to get your questions answered. So from everybody at Government Technology and for Archive Social and the State of South Carolina. Thank you, everybody, for today's presentation. Look for that link in your email. Share it with your friends, and we look forward to seeing you on the next Government Technology Webinar. Have a great afternoon, everybody.